told the organizers that I didn't need an introduction. Uh, but I feel I should say a few things up front for the few people who do not know enough about me to know this. I am not an evangelical Protestant. <laughs> um, I am also not an opponent of same-sex marriage. I am a strong supporter of same-sex marriage and have been advocating it not only as a normative matter, uh, but as a matter of the correct result under connect the dots doctrinalism in constitutional law, basically since I entered the legal academy uh, many, many years ago. Um, you know, Justice Scalia and I agree about few things, but one of them is that uh, a connect the dots doctrinalist looking at the majority opinion in Lawrence against Texas could only conclude uh, that same-sex marriage uh, is now something that uh, under substantive due process uh, people have a constitutional uh, right uh, to. Uh, you know, Justice Scalia and I uh, agree about the descriptive and disagree about the normative. I think that's terrific. He thinks that's terrible, but we both agree that that is. Um, long before Lawrence, uh, I have been uh, and remain of the view uh, that under connect the dots doctrinalism, uh, under equal protection uh, on grounds of sex, uh, marriage is uh, one of the, uh, the requirement that there be uh, one person of each sex to have a marriage is one of the last remaining, quote, fixed notions concerning the roles and abilities of males and females, unquote, left in American law. And if you recognize that quote, you will know uh, that it is what the Supreme Court has been saying for decades now is the standard by which uh, a sex-respecting rule is judged unconstitutional. If it embodies such a fixed notion, then it's got constitutional problems uh, as, uh, as sex discrimination. Um, but notwithstanding uh, these views of mine, I've been spending a fair amount of time recently trying to understand, as it were, from the inside, some of the most often and vehemently voiced objections to same-sex marriage. Um, and uh, there are a couple of them that I have understood from the beginning perfectly, but happen not to agree with. Uh, for example, uh, my old friend and former employer, Judge Robert Smith, wrote the majority opinion in Hernandez v. Robles, uh, the New York same-sex marriage case, uh, in which he, uh, as many other judges also have, said, among other things, that the interests of procreation makes it appropriate to limit uh, marriage to persons of opposite sexes. Uh, now, I understand that perfectly. I don't agree with it at all, but I have no problem uh, grasping it. Uh, here are some that I have a little bit more trouble uh, understanding, in addition to the one I'm going to focus on today. Um, you know, one of the earliest same-sex marriage cases from the 70s, uh, the judge deciding against the uh, lesbian couple who sought a marriage license said, quote, the relief the plaintiff's couples seek cannot be granted because what they are seeking is not a marriage, unquote. Now, that seems to me to uh, put marriage in the category of natural kinds. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I understand that. The best I can do to understand it from the inside is to say uh, maybe what they're seeking is not a marriage in the same way that three can't be a couple. Three people can be many things but not a couple. Even if uh, I can understand that as a matter of, uh, of a philosophical objection, I have a really hard time understanding that as a matter of American law because plenty of things are natural kinds that are uh, unproblematically defined differently in law, and we accept that without straying too far from the matter at issue. Consider mother and father, right? Uh, we, in a country that has a long history of accepting adoption, uh, define mother and father in law very differently from the way mother and father might be defined in nature uh, or uh, in philosophical reasoning. Um, one of the other ones uh, I've tried to understand, and I've had no success at if some, one of you uh, can help me out, I'd appreciate that, uh, is the claim that marriage is a pre-political institution. Uh, among the people I've tried to discuss this with, uh, or a Catholic archbishop from Chicago, Archbishop Paprocki, who wrote about this for a symposium in uh, Loyola Law School, and he the Bible uh, or God for this proposition. And what I said to him is, you know, I understand that pair bonding might be pre-political, but, you know, you as a Catholic believe that marriage cannot involve divorce. Without theological arguments, how can the absence of divorce be something pre-political? I mean, that is to say, uh, the, the institutional structure to keep people together has got to be something, at least in my view, that, that post-states something political. Um, the one of the objections that I think I've had the most success understanding is uh, perhaps 
paradoxically, the one that gets the most negative publicity, the one that is seen uh, as uh, a joke. Uh, and it's you know, the one that you may have seen in countless uh, humorous editorial cartoons and, and uh, humor columns, which is the claim that I'm going to focus on, which is the claim most often, although not exclusively, raised by evangelical Protestants, that their own marriages are somehow threatened by state recognition of same-sex marriages. Uh, you know, among the cartoons are one, for example, there's this nice elderly heterosexual couple sitting by their uh, fireplace in an easy chair saying, you know, the lesbians down the street are getting married, now we really need to get a divorce. Um, now, the more I thought about this, the more I think that these Protestant protesters are exactly right. And uh, most of the rest of my talk is going to be explaining why uh, I think so. And at the end, I'll give my own normative take uh, on this uh, issue. Uh, they're right because Protestants in the United States have essentially abdicated the definition of marriage, its formation, and above all, its dissolution to the state. There's no air, really, between marriage uh, as the Protestants uh, define it to their flock and marriage as the state defines it. I think one way of making this uh, clear uh, is to point out that this is not true uh, for several other major religious groups in this country, uh, notably uh, Catholics and Jews. So Catholics famously uh, do not recognize divorce. And this helps them understand full well that marriage in their faith tradition and marriage as the state defines it are not the same thing. So that one can be married in the eyes of the church uh, and not of the state and vice versa. The paradigmatic case uh, is the divorced and remarried Catholic. Uh, in the eyes of the state, he's uh, remarried to his new spouse. In the eyes of the church, uh, that second marriage has no effect uh, and he still remains married uh, to uh, the first spouse. Um, Catholics do, however, have a means that de facto serves to dissolve uh, marriages, and that's the procedure for annulment uh, in canon law. Uh, you know, it's made famous in the popular press by, among other, among other things, uh, Sheila Roush Kennedy's book uh, talking about, uh, it, it's called Shattered Faith, talking about uh, uh, her, her annulment procedure from uh, one uh, of the political uh, Kennedys. And what this annulment procedure allows is through legal process, through advocates and judges, uh, the dissolution of a Catholic marriage, uh, dissolution on the grounds that it never really existed, that the spouses were in some way uh, disqualified from entering uh, marriage uh, with one another. Um, there's a similar difference between marriage as the civil law defines it and as the faith defines it uh, that's true uh, of, of observant Jews. Um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm less of an expert uh, in Jewish law, and I realize that on Rosh Hashanah I'm not likely to find uh, many experts in the audience. But uh, as I understand it, um, just as Catholics have their annulment procedure, so observant Jews have a religious divorce procedure. Uh, the divorce is called a get, and it's issued by the husband to the wife uh, through the intermediary of a tribunal known as a beth din. Uh, and this is actually something that has become uh, of great uh, relevance to family law uh, lawyers uh, in the United States. Uh, and the reason why uh, is because uh, of the situation uh, of someone that uh, under Jewish law is called the aguna, or the bound woman. That is to say, uh, she is uh, a woman religiously married uh, to a man who then declines to give her uh, a religious divorce. So the problem uh, that occurs is that there's a civil divorce proceeding, sometimes even initiated by the very same husband, uh, which then results in a civil dissolution of marriage. Uh, but if the husband refuses to give his wife a religious divorce, uh, the wife is still bound to him such that she can't, uh, under religious law, remarry, such that any children she may have with her civilly uh, married new husband uh, might uh, not be recognized as legitimate uh, under, uh, under Jewish law. And the civil law has actually uh, tried to do interesting things to, to solve this. Uh, the New York courts uh, have been uh, in the forefront uh, of this. Um, and they've tried to make it a condition uh, of civil divorce that a Jewish husband grant uh, his wife uh, a get. Uh, they did this initially by case law and eventually then by statute, a statute that talks in general terms uh, about a condition for civil divorce being, quote, for spouses to take all steps within their power to remove any religious or conscientious restraints uh, on the other spouse's remarriage. Uh, now, uh, you may immediately see interesting and difficult constitutional questions with this, and I'll come back to 
uh, to some of them shortly. Uh, but for the moment, let me just reinforce that Catholics and Jews have reason to understand the difference between civil and religious marriage. Protestants have reasons uh, not to. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal historical reasons why this is so. Uh, but before I do, I want to give you what, for me, was the aha moment for this theory, when I realized, uh, you know, at least by my own lights, I was on to something, which is that um, in a series of polls taken over the last several years since same-sex marriage became a front-burner topic uh, in the American political scene, um, there's a fairly consistent set of statistics. Uh, these are polls which, um, whatever their underlying view of homosexuality, uh, that is to say, both among populations that are relatively sympathetic uh, to gay rights uh, otherwise and populations that are relatively unsympathetic, uh, there's, this, there's the following fairly consistent uh, difference, which you don't see uh, as strongly with respect to other gay rights issues like employment non-discrimination, like don't ask, don't tell, uh, like uh, hate crimes uh, legislation uh, for gays and lesbians. Uh, it is that um, there's roughly a 20% difference uh, between the attitudes of Protestants uh, and Catholics uh, when it comes uh, to same-sex marriage. Let me just give you the representative uh, poll numbers from a Pew poll uh, from about two years ago. Um, they, as far as I understand, uh, this hasn't changed uh, significantly uh, over time. Uh, in that Pew poll, among, uh, among that, in that Pew poll, 55% of Jews supported same-sex marriage. Uh, now you're saying, uh, not surprising, Jews are on average more liberal than the population uh, as a whole, and observant Jews are a minority uh, among Jews. Um, but then, among white Roman Catholics, only 48% opposed same-sex marriage. And this was lower than the population as a whole. That is to say, the population as a whole more hostile to same-sex marriage than the Catholic population. 52% of Latino Catholics, 71% of Latino Protestants, 72% of black Protestants, 75% of white evangelical Protestants. One of the most recent polls in connection with uh, an election issue that has taken a uh, low second place to the presidential elections, which is the question uh, in California whether the, same, uh, whether the Supreme Court uh, of California's decision that uh, marriage rights must be given to same-sex couples should be overturned by constitutional amendment, there's a similar division. Um, Protestants, by a majority, favor the proposition, oppose same-sex marriage. Catholics, by a majority, oppose the proposition. 55% of Catholics think same-sex marriage is just fine with them, notwithstanding that Archbishop Paprocki uh, and Pope Benedict have been uh, inveighing against uh, same-sex marriage uh, at least as um, urgently as uh, any Protestant pastor. Um, now, before uh, I talk to you about what this may mean for us and what the law to do about it, uh, I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of legal history uh, to show you why I think we got here. Uh, you may or may not know uh, that the um, English state came relatively late to the regulation uh, of marriage. Uh, initially, marriage uh, in the uh, English legal tradition uh, was a private contract for the purchase of a wife. Purely private, no trace of public license or registration, no authoritative intervention by either a priest or a civil functionary, purely a private business transaction. Um, and when there came to be more regulation, uh, it did not come in the first instance from the state, but from the church through the canon law. So it was the canon law that defined who was married and who was not. And the state was, as it were, a taker and not a maker of marriage. Various civil consequences followed uh, from uh, the question of who was married. For example, uh, consequences like uh, inheritance of property and legitimacy of children. Uh, but it was the church who decided in the first instance who was married. Uh, and it did so uh, from the time of Pope Alexander III in the Middle Ages, uh, simply by requiring the exchange of words of present consent. So two people uh, of opposite sexes who were of legal age, uh, not too closely related to one another, and not otherwise married, uh, would be married simply if they said to each other, uh, in private in a hayloft, as well as in public before witnesses, the words, I marry you. Now, it's very important that those words be in the present tense, 
because words in the future tense were uh, words for a promise to marry, and unless sexual intercourse followed, they didn't produce uh, marriage. And there's umpteen lawsuits about the use of the tenses here. Um, a yeah, famous legal historian famously said, "Lovers of all people are the trouble who have the, are the people who have the most difficulty distinguishing between the present and the future." Um, and I think that that uh, was a problem, uh, a practical problem for Pope Alexander III's views. Um, so eventually, there came to be more formality uh, injected uh, into uh, marriage. The English Church became fussier, and the English state became fussier. But it wasn't until uh, the 18th century uh, that the English state finally and definitively asserted control over marriage, saying none of this merely contractual stuff, no uh, words of con present consent will do, uh, not even more formal private contracting will do, but you have to come to us. You have to come to our official representatives uh, if you want to be recognized as married. Um, and, but it did so through the established Church of England not through um, any secular uh, mechanism. Um, and uh, it, the act uh, was known, it's a 1753 act for the better prevention of clandestine marriages, popularly known as Lord Hardwick's act for the Lord Chancellor that shepherded it through Parliament. Uh, one of the things that has also obsessed me in my study uh, of the law of marriage uh, has been that uh, Lord Hardwick's act was almost simultaneous with the Bubble Act. Uh, in which the English state did similar things for corporations as it did for marriage. That is to say, it said, no private contracting for corporate status or limited liability. You have to come to us if you want to be a, a corporation, and we are going to set the terms uh, on, uh, on which uh, you do that. Uh, more of that uh, later. Uh, but for the moment, it's important to recognize uh, that it was the established church and ministers of the established church uh, who could perform uh, marriages. There were some exceptions for the marriages of Jews, um, and uh, none for, uh, for other groups, including uh, Catholics. Now, 1753 was after uh, habits of marriage had or, uh, already been developed uh, in the United States. Uh, but um, even in the United States, in the colonies, there's an interesting difference uh, in the formation of marriage. The southern colonies, dominated by uh, members of the Anglican Church, had the tradition that we have today, which is that ministers were the principal celebrants of marriage, which marriages were then civilly, legally recognized. On the other hand, uh, in Puritan New England, marriage was a civil contract. And not only were clergy not authorized to perform marriages, uh, they were disinvited from even attending the ceremony because it was thought that this would create too much confusion uh, between marriage, which the Puritans saw as a civil contract, uh, and uh, religion. Now, I want to pause on that interesting dis distinction, push it back into history and forward into the present uh, and future. So why did the Puritans have this view? They might have gotten it from the Netherlands, which is where they came from directly before they uh, came to uh, Plymouth Rock. The Netherlands also had the notion that marriage was a civil contract, and if you look beyond the United States into the rest of the world for places where the recognition of same-sex marriage uh, has been in the forefront, uh, you look to the Netherlands, one of the first countries to recognize any legal relationship at all uh, between members of a same-sex couple with rights and obligations approximating marriage. Uh, and then a few years later, perhaps the first uh, in the world, to grant civil marriage to same-sex couples. Uh, if you come back to the United States, look at where uh, civil recognition for same-sex couples has been in the forefront. Uh, and you'll see that it has been in New England, in the former Puritan colonies. Uh, Vermont was the first state through litigation uh, called Baker versus Vermont and subsequent legislation uh, that was demanded by the Vermont Supreme Court under the state constitution uh, to grant, to, to grant same-sex couples civil union status, which is very close to uh, the legal obligations of marriage without the name of marriage. Uh, Massachusetts was the first state to grant same-sex couples full civil marriage. Connecticut was the first state to do either without there being litigation uh, pushing them forward. The legislature of Connecticut, without judicial prompting, passed a civil union law very much like uh, Vermont. Now, what do these three states have in common, these three states in the forefront? Uh, one of the things that is most obvious and most frequently cited is they're among the bluest states in the country. Uh, they're liberal, and you would imagine that uh, same-sex marriage would uh, be less threatening to them. 
But two other things should probably be taken into account. One is uh, that each of these states has a legal historical tradition of Puritan marriage, of recognizing marriage principally as a civil contract uh, with religion taken as far as possible uh, out of the picture. And the second is something that you might initially think uh, is um, a problem. Um, and um, I actually think contributes, which is that each of these states has a comparatively high percentage of Catholics in the population. Um, and this turns out to work in favor of same-sex couples, uh, I would argue, uh, even though uh, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church uh, would wish it were otherwise. Um, now, the tendency of Protestants to conflate civil and religious marriage doesn't just, I think, explain the virulence of objections uh, by evangelical Protestants to state recognition of same-sex marriage. It also explains another interesting development in family law, which is covenant marriage. Uh, do you all know what covenant marriage is? Or okay, um, it's something that's now only available in uh, largely in those states that were part of the uh, Anglican early settlement. That is to say, in, in southern states in the in the United States. Um, and it's somewhat harder to get out of than ordinary civil marriage. Ordinary civil marriage is terminable at will uh, in most states. And covenant marriage doesn't make divorce impossible, but it makes divorce much, much harder, uh, to, or somewhat harder to get. Now, poli political uh, scientists that have been looking at how covenant marriage laws got to be passed uh, in the last decade or so in the United States, um, have noted that, um, particularly in Louisiana, the first state to adopt it, uh, evangelical Protestants played a leading role. Evangelical Protestants, including Tony Perkins, whom you, whom you may have heard of, um, who thought that this legislation was a politically more palatable alternative to their preferred option of generally reinstituting state laws, limiting access to divorce, and restoring the requirement that someone must be to blame for the failure uh, of a marriage. That is to say, in most states, uh, New York being an exception, divorce is no fault. Um, I think this is also accounted for by the fact that there's no air between civil and religious marriage for Protestants. So a Catholic priest can wave his finger at the faithful and say, don't get divorced and make it stick, legally through canon law. Protestant pastors can also wag their fingers and say, don't get divorced, but there's nothing legally in either church law or in civil law that gives them enforcement power. Uh, and there are rumors that when covenant marriage first passed, Protestant pastors threatened not to marry members of their congregation uh, unless uh, they were getting a covenant marriage. Actually, didn't work. The percentage of covenant marriages, percentage of marriages, minuscule. Uh, but I still think it's an interesting fact. Catholics, on the other hand, were not thrilled about the passage uh, of covenant marriage. The Catholic hierarchy uh, did not uh, support this, uh, nor did uh, the Catholic populace. Now. I hope you've been able to see that there are interesting parallels in this historical and analytical account to another major contemporary issue about which evangelical Protestants are also exercised, um, and that's the public schools. Um, what I think you see in the, uh, in the, with marriage is you have Protestants taking a nominally secular institution, co-opting it for sectarian ends, getting accustomed to their ownership of this institution, and then feeling an understandable, although not in my view justifiable, sense of grievance uh, when that ownership is challenged and taken away. And those of you who uh, may have looked uh, at the history uh, of public education uh, in the United States uh, can see that this is directly parallel to the more longstanding uh, and famous arguments about public schools. So Protestants also, uh, with the schools as with marriage, took this uh, institution um, that's civil and nominally secular, um, state-funded, state-sponsored, state-regulated, co-opted it for sectarian ends, and then felt this loss of grievance when their control was challenged. And they started feeling this sense of loss and grievance uh, in the 19th century Bible wars, where there was dispute about whether the King James or some other version of the Bible should be taught, continues uh, through the 20th century through disputes about prayer in the schools, uh, to the present day disputes about creationism uh, versus uh, intelligent design. Now, as with the schools, uh, so with marriage, um, Catholics initially went into the Bible wars thinking we're going to win, right? We want our Douay version of the Bible to be taught uh, right next to uh, the King James. We want state funding for our uh, sectarian schools if the Protestants are going to get it. 
they lost that war long ago and then developed their own institutions. There are Catholic parochial schools. There are uh, Jewish uh, schools. Uh, there were not, until fairly recently, Protestant schools in large numbers. And Protestant schools developed in the South uh, in large numbers, uh, partly as a result uh, of Brown v. Board and mandatory desegregation, uh, but also partly uh, as a result of the uh, bans on prayer uh, and Bible reading in the schools that uh, reared their head uh, almost uh, coterminously. Um, so that's yeah, the, the, the first half of the, of the presentation. That's the, uh, the descriptive uh, historical part. Uh, now uh, I want to, for the second half, uh, give you my own views about what the law should do about this. And I come at this not just as a feminist and a supporter of same-sex marriage, and a scholar of the regulation of sexuality, uh, but also a constitutional law scholar um, as a teacher uh, of the First Amendment uh, and as a comparativist. Now, anyone who has even just a colloquial understanding uh, of the First Amendment's non-establishment clause uh, and the separation of church and state that uh, many people believe it to mandate should be surprised by the way in which the civil law of the United States regulates marriage. The idea that a minister of the gospel or other member of the clergy can simultaneously and seamlessly perform both a religious and a civil marriage should be pretty antithetical to our views of, uh, of separation of church and state. And it's important to note that this is not the way a whole lot of other countries, including some, like for example Germany, which I study, which constitutionally enshrine not the separation of church and state, but cooperation between church and state, go about regulating marriage. So in Germany, for example, and there are many other examples, only civil marriage has the force of law, and it may be performed only by a civil registrar. German couples can have an entirely separate religious ceremony if they want to, but that ceremony has no legal effect uh, under German law. And it seems to me that one of the things we might consider doing is following the German example either by disaggregating civil and religious marriage uh, while calling both of them marriage, or by adopting innovative terms like civil union for anything the state does and leaving the term marriage to uh, religious communities. Uh, this would uh, incidentally solve some problems other than the one I'm centrally addressing. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know whether you know, but it's in most states uh, some sort of a crime. Not a capital offense as it was under Hardwick's Act. It was a, it was a death penalty offense and ministers were executed uh, for uh, performing marriages without a civil license. Uh, it's a crime, uh, again, more like a misdemeanor, for members of the clergy authorized to perform marriages uh, in most states to do so in the absence of a civil license and in a way not designed to have binding effect uh, under civil uh, law. Um, this leads me to a, to a fun quiz question, which is, uh, what does a marriage license license? And the answer most people instinctively give is, is it licenses the couple. It doesn't. It licenses the celebrant to perform the marriage. Um, and the notion that someone needs a state license uh, to perform a, a religious act uh, should be uh, bizarre uh, and frightening from an establishment clause perspective, but also from, uh, from a re religious uh, liberty perspective. And um, the current configuration of the legal regulation of marriage is making this far more salient because uh, a, a, an underexplored facet of several of the states that have uh, allowed legal recognition for same-sex couples through a mechanism other than marriage, like domestic partnership, uh, is that uh, among them California and New Jersey have allowed domestic partnership for a small subset of heterosexual couples. That subset includes uh, opposite sex couples, one of whose members is a senior citizen, is over the age of 62. Uh, and as I understand it, the reason for this was to, uh, principally to preserve pension rights uh, and to facilitate uh, inheritance for people who were uh, widows and widowers from uh, a prior civil marriage uh, who wanted uh, a companion in old age but didn't want to lose the pension benefits uh, they had uh, inherited from their now deceased spouse. Now you can easily imagine, and I've uh, been presented by rabbis with the problem of, some of these couples who uh, you know, want to get married under a hopa but do not want this to have 
civil legal effect. For civil legal purposes, they only want a, a domestic partnership. As the law now stands, um, a minister or a rabbi who a, a, a accommodates them in this request could be uh, at risk uh, of breaking uh, the law. Um, now, one possibility is getting the state out of the business of recognizing marriages uh, entirely, and some people do uh, advocate this. Uh, I have uh, set out at length uh, elsewhere uh, reasons why I don't think this is a good idea, uh, reasons that also demonstrate why I'm at the University of Chicago, because the reason uh, I think it's most salient is that quintessential U of C reason efficiency. Uh, what a marriage uh, license through the state does, it seems to me, uh, is precisely what a, a corporate charter through the state does. It uh, signals not so much to the members of the couple themselves, who are relatively free under current law, to contract uh, and to live freely their lives as they see fit, but to third parties with whom they are dealing. So that uh, you know, a marriage license serves uh, as a mutual pointing over, as a default matter, of the members of the couple to each other. Um, saying I, you, and you, me, as the default person for, for example, who makes my medical decisions. Only the default person, but it's useful to have uh, a default person. Uh, and this is uh, an efficiency. An efficiency that also, uh, interestingly, it, it would allow those who wanted to to stop sliding down the slippery slope of polygamy. Uh, because it only efficiency, efficiently works for two people. With more than two people, you are already in the realm of contracting and individual decision making. Again, imagine the situation where uh, one of the spouses uh, is uh, lying in the hospital, and one of the uh, yeah one of the two polygamous co-spouses says pull the plug, and the other one says all heroic measures. Not so simple, right? Whereas uh, two, one pointing over at the other. Uh, has its efficiency advantages, and state recognition has its efficiency advantages, uh, partly because of uh, the numerous clauses rule, that is to say, um, not too many different forms uh, and easily uh, recognizable uh, forms. In any event, um, coming back to the question uh, of the reaction of, the, uh, of religious communities to this, some of the evangelical Protestants I'm discussing might well be amenable to the situation uh, of the state getting entirely out of the business of, uh, of regulating and licensing uh, adult uh, relationships. Um, they um, would think that this would allow them to develop their notion of marriage more fully with respect to their community. Um, there are some Protestants in the United States uh, who think this way. John Witte of Emory has uh, written and, uh, and thought about them uh, a fair amount. You also see this happening with respect to Muslims in countries like Canada, who have sought uh, to have arbitral tribunals recognized to uh, apply the Muslim law uh, of marriage and divorce, and so far are uh, not uh, getting uh, much receptivity from, uh, from the Canadian government. There are, however, other uh, Protestants uh, in the United States uh, and Tony Perkins, I think, is a great example of this, uh, for whom that would not be a good solution uh, because what they want to do is not just to influence their own congregations uh, to live by their rules of marriage, but to uh, affect uh, all the rest of us. Uh, I would ca I've called in other work these latter group of people perfectionists. They, they're not talking uh, only in the first person. They're also talking in the second and third person about what you and they ought to do, not just about what I and we, uh, the members of our faith community, uh, ought to do. Um, but I would urge on this latter group of people uh, a couple of things. First of all, when they talk, uh, as in the same-sex marriage context they so often do, about, quote, preserving traditional marriage, unquote, one thing I think they ought to realize is how little of traditional marriage, by anyone's definition, there is left to preserve uh, in the American civil law of marriage. And here I'm making simply a descriptive claim. You, you may think this is a terrible thing. Uh, you may think this is a terrific thing. Uh, but I don't think you can dispute, if you think about it, that it's a fact. Um, for example, um, marriage used to be for life and monogamous, as enforced by the civil law. It isn't anymore. Uh, anyone can get a divorce, uh, and few, if any, are, are at risk of uh, being charged criminally uh, with adultery. Marriage used to be a status institution with mandatory rules imposed by the state. It's become far more contractual with couples free to uh, structure their relationship. Uh, again, I'll come back to the analogy between marriage and business corporations. Um, 
you know, if you look at the long history of the legal recognition of both marriage and corporations in Anglo-American law, one of the things you'll see is that they both, both used to be only for the favorites of the state and only for eliminate, for, excuse me, enumerated worthy purposes, like, for example, having children on the one hand uh, or exploring the West Indies on the other. Um, and uh, over those enumerated worthy purposes, they held a legal uh, monopoly. Um, now, uh, marriage no longer has a legal monopoly over either sex uh, or uh, reproduction. Um, and it also used to be, uh, and, and anyone can get married for any purpose uh, whatsoever, uh, which need not even be articulated so long as it's legal, just the, as anyone may incorporate for any legal purpose without even meaning uh, to disclose that purpose. Uh, that purpose. Um, consider, for example, also the analogy between divorce and bankruptcy. Um, both of them used to be seen as deep moral failings um, that uh, were designed to uh, provoke shame um, and uh, moral condemnation. Um, and you can only get them uh, on certain enumerated grounds. Not only were there fault grounds for divorce, but Douglas Baird assures me there are so things called acts of bankruptcy, uh, which if you didn't uh, engage in, you couldn't go bankrupt no matter how insolvent uh, you were. Now both divorce and bankruptcy uh, are seen as something uh, that uh, is not, uh, at least as a matter of law, infused with deep moral fault. Their purpose is, and this word is salient in, in both legal contexts, to provide a fresh start, to put assets to productive use as soon as possible, whether those be reproductive assets uh, in the marriage context or financial assets uh, in, uh, in both uh, contexts. Um, Okay, and then the, for me the most important um, difference uh, between traditional marriage and the marriage we have today uh, is that uh, which pertains uh, to sex role differentiation. Now one of the other projects that I've engaged in uh, is looking at uh, the history of marriage to see what if anything is constant in the history of marriage. Now if you go back in long history and around the world, what is there about marriage that, uh, that you always see? And I have to say that one of the aspects of traditional marriage that is both the most traditional and the most predominant is sex role differentiation. It used to be not only sex role differentiation, but sex role subordination uh, of women, right? You know, Blackstone, the, 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 man and, uh, the husband and wife are one, and the one is the husband, right? Um, but this sex role differentiation is completely ruled out of bounds as a matter of constitutional law uh, in the United States. All of the role differentiation within marriage, to the extent that role differentiation tracked sex, is gone from the law of marriage and cannot be brought back, unlike, for example, uh, prohibitions on divorce uh, or sex outside of marriage, uh, without uh, major constitutional uh, change in the United States. And it is perfectly clear that one of the things many of these evangelical Protestants would like to bring back is this aspect of traditional marriage. But it's not there to be brought back, and they can't bring it back. And let me uh, come up with another uh, uh, analogy here, which is that um, it was not coincidentally until 1998 which was after uh, the US civil marriage law stopped enforcing sex role differentiation, that the Southern Baptists uh, famously uh, promulgated a directive that it was a wife's duty graciously to submit to her husband's servant leadership. Now before then, they could depend on the civil law uh, for, to enforce the submission uh, to some extent uh, of wives uh, to their husbands. Uh, now they're promulgating it um, in, in a religious fashion, and if they're going to do it, that's the way uh, they, they ought to be doing it. Uh, within the civil law, one of the spouses can be a breadwinner and the other a homemaker, but the law not only does not, but cannot demand that the breadwinner be male, that the homemaker uh, be female. Uh, this is also something that many evangelical Protestants have seen as a loss, but unlike the disaggregation of re religious and civil marriage, they've already su su suffered this loss. And like the disaggregation of religious and civil marriage, I think it's a, a, a loss that the Constitution demands uh, that they suffer. Let me stop there.
happy to take questions, comments, expressions of outrage or puzzlement. Yes? Is there any indication uh, whether in uh, legal systems where Catholics would have been the majority or these would have controlled the uh, development of the legal system that Protestants may have also developed some sort of parallel uh, um, Not that I know of. Um, and I would welcome information about this. I've actually been trying to get what kinds of um, legal or quasi-legal structures for the dissolution of marriage there might be uh, in Protestant communities. Anybody else? Yes. Let's talk about, you, you mentioned really quickly at the beginning uh, the regulation of reproduction. Uh, talk about why or why not you think that that has any implication on marriage and um, or if it does or does not. Let me, for example, let me first of all say I'm going to keep using the term same sex marriage because homosexual marriage has been a possibility in the United States forever, right? Um, you know, in any state in the country at any time in American history, a gay man and a lesbian could marry. Um, it's two men who cannot marry and two women who cannot marry under civil law in the United States. Um, and let me. First, talk about it from the, from the constitutional perspective. Okay, my view is that um, if we take ordinary connect the dots black letter doctrinalism on sex discrimination, fixed notions concerning the roles and abilities of males and females are anathema when embodied in law. Saying that you need one of each to uh, raise a child is such a fixed notion. I mean, I, 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 I've repeated this joke uh, so often that it's no longer funny. But uh, it is true that one of my first reactions when I read the opinion of my old friend Robert Smith um, in the New York same-sex marriage opinion, he said, well, you know, one reason uh, that the state might limit marriage to uh, a man and a woman is that um, children um, are benefited by seeing on a daily basis uh, living examples of what a man and a woman are like. And I have said that this has to be an argument for more nudity in the home. Because there is nothing else under um, American constitutional law that a man and a woman can be said categorically to be like. If you look at the earliest of the same-sex marriage cases that um, was on the verge of ruling in favor of same-sex marriage, the Hawaii case from the mid-90s, uh, the anti-same-sex marriage side brought in experts to talk about um, you know, how ch children were better off raised by their natural parents in a monogamous marriage. And every one of those experts said, gay people can do a fine job uh, raising parents. It's not categorical. And what the United States law of sex discrimination requires, and this is something I've written on separately at great length, is a categorical difference between males and females if there's going to be a legal difference between males and females. And there's no categorical uh, difference relevant to marriage uh, between males and females. The second part of this, of course, is that marriage and childbearing and child rearing have been disaggregated uh, in American law. Um, there are virtually uh, no differences between the rights and obligations uh, of parents vis-a-vis -vis their children, depending on whether or not the parents are now or were ever married to one another. The one um, difference that I know of is that it is a presumption of um, paternity for um, the husband of a married woman who bears a child. That child is presumed to be his child. Uh, but other than that, uh, the vast gap between uh, treating illegitimate children as, uh, in the Latin phrase, filius nullius, no one's children. And no one's means not only their fathers, but if you took the law seriously enough, not even their mothers. Uh, and married children having all kinds of rights and obligations, children of married couples having all kinds of rights and obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis their parents, that's gone. And so leaving this in place seems anomalous. So my question is, so you're talking about this from a constitutional perspective? Yes. Um, so, so the idea, if I'm understanding correctly, is that um, by leaving this in place, it's 
arbitrary and discriminatory and blatantly so, given the fact that these other constitutional notions have already been done. I would start there. I mean, you know, I, I would also have uh, policy arguments, but I am principally a constitutional lawyer, and if I can start with and win with constitutional arguments, that's where I'll go. Yeah. As a Baptist, I think you are underestimating the you know, traditional role of the Protestant church in its own rules. And one of the things this is clearly done within many Protestant churches is the question of, you know, someone else has made a determination that this person is baptized. But we look at this person and say, I'm sorry, you're baptized as an infant, you're baptized at eight years old. We only accept uh, adult baptism. Uh, question with membership. Uh, some hey, my church has gone through the question of, you know, do we, uh, you know, how do you submit to a list of questions about your beliefs? That was one of our methods in the past. Now it's by altar call. But there's a very strong tradition, of, you know, letter, can you join my letter of transfer? You have to take a different method. And so when it comes to the question of marriage, I think actually uh, a same-sex marriage and discussion of same-sex marriage becomes more common in America. What you're going to find is a re-emphasis in the Protestant churches, maybe one it never had before, on the role of the church as the institution of marriage. And I actually do think the fact that, uh, you know, last month my pastor married uh, two couple, uh, two people who are both uh, same, of the same sex and members of the church. And that was an act of, you know, we are the church, we disagreed with the state. And whether or not the, you know, an individual church comes down on the side of, we disagree with the state's rules, so we're going to uh, marry couples of the same sex, or we disagree with the church, state's rules, so we're not going to do it. I think the fact that some sort of diversion, you know, difference has developed is actually going to reemphasize uh, religion in America. Um, I don't disagree with you. Indeed, what you are describing is what I would hope for. I would urge those Protestant churches and individuals with those churches who have focused their attention on the civil law of marriage to instead focus their attention on the religious law of marriage and mechanisms akin to the mechanisms you're describing for recognizing membership for recognizing marriage uh, within that tradition. Um, because the state did not help out the Baptists in determining who was a member of their church and did help out the Baptists in determining who was married, the Baptists have developed, as you've described, a mechanism for the former and not yet for the latter. You've also given me uh, the uh, occasion to, to make one other thing clear. All forms of Protestantism in the United States have been dependent on the state for a marriage. What I've said about evangelical Protestants is no less true uh, of mainstream Protestants uh, of um, liberal Protestants, uh, you know, of people from the Episcopal or Congregational uh, churches, for example. Um, but the difference is that it's the evangelical Protestants for whom there's now a gap opening up between marriage as the state of Massachusetts, for example, defines it, and marriage uh, as their faith tradition defines it. Whereas uh, a lot of the churches that are descendants of the Puritan churches were ahead of the state in recognizing the ability of members of the same sex uh, to marry. Uh, there are still, uh, I believe, uh, more uh, faith communities uh, in the United States than there are states in the Union uh, that would recognize uh, same-sex marriage. Yes? Um, I'm wondering, yeah, I'm understanding Stereotyping on the basis of that categorical distinction. That is to say, something that is true of all men or no men or all women or no women can be the basis for a constitutionally acceptable sex distinction in law. But something that is true of the vast majority of women, but not all women, isn't. I'm just wondering what your take is on certain states that have amended their state constitution. I would think that correctly interpreted um, federal constitutional law would declare that to be unconstitutional. This is why I began with Justice Scalia, right? I think Justice Scalia and I are in many respects on the same page when it comes to this. 
as a matter of descriptive constitutional law. Again, he thinks it's a terrible thing. I think it's a great thing. We both think that um, that's where the, that's how the dots connect. Um, now, for understandable reasons, the federal courts in the United States have not wanted to take this on and connect the dots. And it happens that, they have, that the lower federal courts have a great excuse not to, which is that the earliest same-sex marriage case actually made its way up to the Supreme Court in the early 1970s, before all of the modern su uh, substantive due process decisions beyond Griswold, for example, Eisenstadt, um, and before any um, constitutional decision by the Supreme Court had held any discrimination on the basis of sex to have constitutional problems. That case, um, Baker versus Nelson, involving, as it happens, a law student uh, from the University of Minnesota, um, and the partner with whom I understand he still is uh, 35 years later, um, the Supreme Court dismissed for want of a substantial federal question. And that means that there's some precedential value on the lower federal courts uh, so that they would have to be reaching if they were to um, declare that same-sex marriage um, was constitutionally mandated by the federal constitution. Um, and I think that the Supreme Court uh, is going to try like mad to duck this. I have pointed out um, before that in, uh, of all cases, the under God flag, flag salute case, Justice Stevens uh, spent a couple of paragraphs talking about how the court, as a prudential matter, tended to stay out of domestic relations uh, issues. And I think, given the timing of that piece of dicta, um, or not, not quite dicta, but you know, went on longer than it needed to, I think he was signaling, we really don't want to uh, decide, among other things, same-sex marriage. We're going to leave this to the states uh, to, to decide. Yes. I just find those uh, arguments from reproductive really interesting because I don't know how they would. Do you, uh, you, I'm sure you know more about them than I do. Um, do you? How do they deal with, um, let's say, elderly couples getting married or sterile couples getting married, or kid, people who just have decide not to have children? Yeah, that, that's where Justice Scalia and I are on the same page. He makes exactly that point, uh, and I would too. Uh, that you know, and this gets back to the notion of stereotyping, right? We do not require of couples that they be. Uh, fertile, that they intend to reproduce, that they be able to reproduce in order for them to marry, which then means that, um, you know, uh, over, yeah, yeah. Um, again, I think they deal with this as a matter of law uh, badly. And I, I keep invoking Justice Scalia in this context because uh, what I want to reinforce is that, uh, you know, there is an ordinary interpretation of law beyond ideology, that your ideology may lead you to repudiate. And even under this ordinary interpretation, you are led to a conclusion which, for some people like Scalia, is terribly unpalatable, but you are led to it. So, so people like that, I guess, would have to be in support of some sort of uh, federal constitutional amendment. Uh, which is one of the reasons why so many people like that are, yes. Uh, I think we need to call it quits. Thank you so much for coming and for listening.